Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ken Elkins, and I am the Community Conservation Manager at Audubon, Connecticut. I'll be sharing with you about bird nests this afternoon. I need to slow down my trained birds here just a second. There we go. Uh, that today, as we are going to explore and take a look into the secret lives of birds while they're nesting. Uh, and I am probably the box that is lighting up for all of you. Here's another photo of me that I am the community conservation manager for Audubon in Connecticut uh, that I have been with National Audubon now for 12 years. And in this photo, I am sharing birds in a different way that I've developed a program for people with dementia and training people in healthcare facilities to use birds as therapy for people with dementias and Alzheimer's and other uh, um, reasons why they might be in long-term care, that it's a great way of reducing stress. And while they might not remember us, it brings joy to their lives. And it's been a fun program to share across the country. Today, as we go along, we have muted everyone at the moment. And if you would like to ask questions, please use the chat box. And if you have certain questions you want to definitely have read at the end of our program that we're going to be I'm gonna to try to keep to about just over half an hour today and then leave us time within our hour to have discussion instead. Uh, you can also reach down and on the chat box where it says everyone, it might be gray or blue for you. You can click and choose just to reach out to one of our co-hosts, Kate Pratt or Jill Bell would be happy to take your questions for you. Uh, especially if you have any technical issues along the way, please alert them first. And uh, let's see. So uh, being based at Audubon in Connecticut, we have three Audubon centers here. There are over 30 Audubon centers across the country that are part of National Audubon Society. Those three red dots represent our different centers. The one in the southwest corner of the state, Audubon Greenwich, was the first Audubon education center in the country, formed in the early 1940s. And then quickly following it in the late 60s, early 70s, was Audubon Sharon with its mile sanctuary of over 2,000 acres of northeastern forests surrounding it. And they have a maple sugaring program on their property as well. And we can see how uh, using our forest to produce products for us like maple syrup can actually make it healthier for birds along the way. And we manage some other habitats across the state as well. That red dot towards the center of the state is the Audubon Bent of the River where I am based and also Kate and sometimes Jillian works with us there as well. And there we have a 700 acre sanctuary. We have 15 miles of hiking trails. And we often get the question, did you have a typo? Why is it bent of the river? And we have that name because it was labeled on the first maps of our little town of Southbury as Ye Bent of Ye River. You can see this dark a uh, curling line across the bottom of the screen and that very sharp U-turn in it was labeled that way in the very first maps in the late 1600s. And that road that you see next to the river and then our little entrance driveway to the left of the river, that was actually the main road through town until the 1800s. So it was a unique landmark and we are lucky enough to have that little piece of history to help us have a unique name like that. Our center was donated by Howard and Althea Clark that uh, they didn't have any heirs. So they pre-planned donating this property to National Audubon Society decades before they passed away. And now we get to have offices within this Civil War era barn. And uh, visitors can get to sit on our birding balcony and look over the hummingbird feeders you see there. And then down in the bottom part of the photo is our demonstration garden of plants for birds. Many of you are familiar with Audubon, uh, but as an educator in Audubon and also working on other conservation programs, I love the concept that where birds thrive, people prosper, that we can help healthcare facilities create areas that are great for birds and it makes their patients more well. And we can add to a schoolyard and create a small urban oasis for birds in New Haven, Connecticut, and the students they're learning during class and this teacher's uh, roles as educators are enriched by having this piece of nature around them. So today, what we are going to share about are the nesting materials that birds are using. 
some nesting locations you might be familiar with, and then there are some unique ones around us as well. Some amazing architecture that we're always surprised, especially because we've got thumbs and fingers, we should be able to maneuver things better, but they seem to be amazing at how they can create these nests. And we're gonna take a little peek at eggs and nestlings at the end before we take a moment to discuss how you can help birds while they are nesting this season still. Our first clue that birds are nesting near us would be that we see them starting to carry nesting materials like this female Eastern bluebird is carrying what looks like dry grasses. And some will also use pine needles. But that's our clue that they are gonna start nesting is that we see them carrying that. And uh, for those who volunteer with your state's breeding bird atlases, if we can see the birds carrying nesting material, that confirms the nesting without having to actually see the nest and follow the birds and to disturb them. So while some of you said you haven't noticed any birds in nests yet. Maybe you might have seen this behavior and now you can appreciate that you know the birds are nesting nearby without disturbing that nest, getting too close to them. Other birds like to use sticks, like house wrens, all across the country. If we have boxes out for other cavity nesting birds, we know that house wrens like those cavities as well. Uh, one thing we can do is we can create nest boxes or other structures with a smaller hole one and one eighth inch wide in diameter will fit a house wren or a chickadee, but not the house sparrows. Uh, it won't allow in bluebirds either, but at least this way you can limit who might be able to nest in there and keep out birds like house sparrows. So this house wren, we see it carrying the stick and I'm always me mesmerized by the concept of the six, eight inch long sticks and how it weaves an entire nest inside the box. Uh, so quite a, engineering skills to be able to fit that stick in and to use it in a proper format too. Some of our other birds like American goldfinches are one of the latest nesting birds across North America. They wait for mid to late summer. They're waiting for some of our flowers like thistles uh, to be blooming or even cone flowers and they take the fluffy part out of the flowers to build their nests, that that's the material they're looking for. So they will wait and they will be able to find enough food. We've even had our bird banders at Audubon in Connecticut that they collected uh, female goldfinches in the nets and the birds have had brood patches that their feathers are missing on their belly for incubating their eggs. And we found that on September 9th last year, a remarkably late date. Other end of the spectrum, some birds seem to carry a whole tree back to their nest, don't they? Birds like ospreys and other hawks will have very large nests and well, they aren't always looking for the perfect stick, are they? That anything seems to do when you're building a nest that looks like a small car sometimes. Uh, ospreys can have nests that are five feet wide. I drove by one earlier today that seemed to be three to four feet deep. And yes, bald eagle nests can get to weigh well over a thousand pounds because if you think about adding all that wood together, it adds up in weight quite quickly. Some other birds like to make sure their materials are sticking together. So if you watch an area with large puddles, you might see the swallows zooming around. And if you take a closer look, they might not be just going to get a drink of water. They're scooping up some of the mud on the edge of that puddle. And Cliff swallows might do the same thing, and some other species might even take away some mud back to their nest. And I was also amused to see this photo in our collection of a big bird with a little stick. Sometimes when we are getting to the, the birds are getting to the final stage, the inner pieces of their nest, they will use a finer material than their outer sections of their nest. And it seems like sometimes they even want to decorate possibly. Uh, this is a photo of a great egret, and you might notice down in the corners that we have photo credits. Um, the majority of these photos you're seeing today were all entered in the Audubon Photography Awards. The uh, Audubon Magazine every year has a contest sponsored by Canon Photography, and these were all entries into that contest. And now uh, when people have entered them, we can use them at Audubon for educational purposes as well, as long as we credit our photographers. So I'm making that statement because I did not take any of these photos today. So we can love the photography. It gives us a new uh, appreciation of the birds around us. 
Um, I like to teach people while we're outdoors more often than not, so I don't usually take the time for the photography myself. Also, we, they have equipment that most of us can't get to. So when we see these photos today, please don't go trying to recreate the photos yourself. These photographers are quite often using blinds so that the birds don't know that they're there and they're using extremely large lenses so that they're further away than you think they are when they're taking these photos so that they don't disturb the actual nesting behaviors. Great blue herons are another bird across most of our areas that we can get to see them and they're colonial. So we'll not see just one nest, but six or seven or eight nests. And if you do get to watch this from a distance, usually with binoculars or with a telescope, a spotting scope possibly, I love this stage of the nesting because uh, it's fun to almost uh, anthropomorphize them, think that they're like human almost because you'll see one bird put a stick in a certain way and then the other, uh, mate will come over and move the stick to a different spot. Clearly they weren't putting it in the right place. Speaking of the photographers, this was just a perfectly timed moment to get to see woodpeckers excavating out their cavity and all that sawdust flying out. This is a northern flicker and this one has a red, red mustache. So this is a flicker you would see from uh, the uh, front range of the Rockies in Colorado and Wyoming and West is where red shafted flickers are found. Woodpeckers sometimes will build more than one nest, so we can't 100% confirm that they're using that nest, but if we're able to follow back after a little bit, we can see whether they're repeatedly using it throughout the day. Uh, their other cavities they build are actually for nighttime roosts so that they can be hidden even when it's warm out. And other birds build cavities as well. Birds like our nut hatches build cavities. They will use nest boxes as well. This is a gorgeous little red-breasted nut hatch looking like he's made a cavity inside a pine tree. And what's great about our cavity nesting birds, the ones that excavate the nests, is that they will only use that hole once, but somebody else might use it in future years, maybe a flycatcher. Or sometimes chickadees excavate, sometimes they don't. That somebody else will be able to use that same hole. And another cavity nester, the pileated woodpecker, we can definitely tell when it's one of this species because their nest hole is usually a little bit more oval because it is almost six inches from top to bottom. Here's a cavity in a different location. Don't know if any of you have ever gotten to see this before, that we have a nest in what looks like a sandbank, and you can almost make out these two little grooves in the bottom of that tunnel. Well, if you're patient enough and you're staying back far enough, because this bird is extremely shy, you might get to learn that this was a nest cavity for the belted kingfisher. And other species of kingfishers will nest in banks as well. Sometimes it's in a sandy area of a gravel pit or something like that as well. Sometimes they might be a quarter and I've even found one a half mile away from water before. So they're not always over the water. Often they are though. That's a big bird to go in a tunnel and then to be able to have a nest. And those nests are at least three feet and sometimes six or eight feet back into the bank. And that's just extraordinary and this is Someone took a um, pro-cam and stuck it down inside. And here you can see the eggs in the bottom of the cavity that they don't put many other nesting materials in. The sand is soft enough for them. And it's surprising for a cavity nester to have that many eggs in one spot. We have uh, Kate on here was checking a tufted titmouse uh, nest box last week was surprised to see a tufted titmouse and I believe she had seven eggs that she found there that the bird was incubating at once. So uh, surprising that we can have such a crowded house in a small place, so to speak. And I mentioned the mud before. Cliff swallows are an amazing bird uh, across the northeast. They can be a little bit more uh, uh, very localized and not all over the northeast. But then when we go across uh, the central part of the U.S. and especially the southwest and near the mountains, well, cliff swallows can even nest in far northern Alaska. It's one of the most northern breeding songbirds we have. And 
look at this nest that they grab a little clumps of clay of mud and they turn it basically into clay and they're bringing back and almost building that brick by brick in this case it's blob by blob to build their nest structure attached to something else whether it's the side of a bridge or we also have them on the sides of uh, hydroelectric plants is quite often another spot that we find them and they can be quite colonial i was at a colony of them this morning as well i'll share that i was near a lot of different birds that i did a birdathon with the donor this morning and we found uh there were at least 55 different chimneys uh cliff swallows zooming back and forth and going in and they were clearly nest building this morning in uh, southwestern Connecticut. One thing that I'm jealous of birds is that they get to choose their real estate. And this case, this bald eagle pair got to choose an amazing view from where their nest was. They're more likely choosing because it feels safe to them in that location and it's near food, two things that we usually choose as well and it's near where we need to work, so to speak. Other birds choose to nest on our beaches. And well, with a big holiday weekend approaching and everyone's been cooped up for quite a long time, we are concerned for our beach nesting birds, especially along the Atlantic coast, the Northeast coast in particular this year. Birds like our piping plovers in particular, that they started, they arrived back in March, they were on nests in April, and they have young about that size about to leave the nest. And uh, once they are hatched, they very quickly will move on to um, running around that they are uh, just like young turkeys and chickens that they will not be able to fly for a while, but they can leave the nest immediately. This photo was really tough to crop but it's adorable to see the pied-billed grebe, the adult here, with one little young face that's so beautifully colored, they're un hiding in under her wings. But the nest, I wish I could then slide this photo for you because it's on a mat of reeds out of cattail leaves and it's floating. That This is on a small marsh and some birds actually build a little floating island for their own nests, like the pied-billed grebe. Locations. Some birds don't mind being near humans so much, do they? And some of them almost thrive being closer to humans. This is a house finch, another bird we find all across North America. Uh, it was actually originally from the Southwest and as it became a bird of the pet trade for many years in the 1800s in particular, it was often escapee and they've been able to breed all across the country now. And yes, we find them very close to people's homes, including uh, this time of year, we get a lot of phone calls that there's a bird nesting in someone's hanging basket. They got them for Mother's Day, and now two weeks later, they're wondering why is there a bird in their hanging basket right by their door? And I'll ask, well, was one of the birds red? And they'll wonder, what? Really? And how'd you know that right away? And it's because we have house finches being one of the most common birds to nest near humans. Another one being tufted titmice. Yes, we can find them deep in the forest. Here's a humorous photo that they took someone's ridiculous uh, mount of a fish. Looks like a fake one at that, but it was a cavity, so the bird took advantage of it. A couple years ago, I got a phone call from my cousin and he had this old truck he hadn't been using much and then he just sold it and they went to go move it and look what was on the back tire underneath the fender. So unfortunately the person purchasing the truck had to wait but luckily if this is happening close to your house this whole nesting cycle happens so ridiculously fast from nest building taking under a week usually laying eggs one egg a day no bird can produce more than one egg a day and then it's usually under 10 days, definitely under two weeks to incubate. And then for most of these songbirds, it is under two weeks before the young are leaving the nest. That it's amazing how quickly they can develop, but also they want to get out of the nest because there's always the chance of predators. And then also there's little insects and mites and little tiny parasite 
like animals that might start to become a problem in a nest as well. So they moved on quickly. So, and at this stage here, the purchaser only need, probably need to wait uh, another four or five days at the maximum before they left the nest. And then once the birds are leaving the nest, they might start to move around and that's where location can be important as well. Falcons will use a edge of a cliff so they need to think about, did they find a ledge big enough for their young to not fall off, but not large enough that the birds start hopping around and are tough to keep track of. Uh, so this is a pair, this is an adult peregrine falcon bringing back food for its young, just about to a fledged uh, bird. And some other nests like this, uh, this actually looks like a common night hawk, actually with the white band there in the flight feathers they nest on the ground and they can be absolutely camouflaged. Uh, that you practically have to step on them before you would notice that there's even a nest there. I did this program a few weeks ago and someone said, why would any birds nest on the ground? Wouldn't it be even easier to be found? Well, a lot of predators have figured out that a lot of birds nest up. So they go up and they don't seek out on the ground very well. So if it's camouflaged, and they don't smell very much, then they won't be found and it might be more successful than being up, say, a foot or two into the bushes where some predators like to look more often. If you have been out and about, you might notice that some birds get more upset and teach us that we're too close to their nest. In this case, this killdeer is doing a distraction display. Not only is it upset that we're nearby, but it is going to try and distract us to get us away from the nest and or young. It will fake that it has a broken wing, which if I was a fox or a coyote, that's a great idea. Hey, let me go get the injured bird. It's a lot easier to catch. And I follow it along and then after 75 yards or so, the adult will just fly away and now I'm lost without any sign of any food. Birders, though, know that if the bird is leading us one way, the nest and the young are the other way. And this was actually a, another Audubon sanctuary, so we were, this was a field staff who did this, and then we left the nest alone immediately. But you can see the egg on the left side there, and right up against the egg is one young facing from left to right, and its beak almost near the pointed part of the egg. And then its head is on one of its siblings, which is then we only see its back and the stripes on the back of its head and its head is pointing straight up to the top of the view. And one more bird is there down in white of the egg as well. Amazing camouflage, isn't it? We also had someone bring us in this nest once. And you look at it and you go, did that was it just so delicate that the nest broke and that's why it only seems like half of a nest? Well, there is one bird that likes to nest up against something that's already there. And chimney swifts nest, like their name suggests, most often in chimneys now. That they use a special part of their saliva and other materials they collect to stick the nest to the inside of a chimney. Before there were chimneys, it was very, very large hollowed out trees that they would nest inside the um, stove pot type, um, stove pipe topped to the tree. So it was still a tunnel up and down like a chimney, so to speak, that they would have used naturally. So in the 1800s in particular, this bird had a great increase with so many more chimneys to be able to use and now, well, we are using less chimneys and we're also capping those chimneys off so other wildlife don't get inside and it's eliminating the nesting possibilities for chimney swifts. But it is amazing to get to see them. Uh, you don't get to see them sitting still like this very often because this is one of the most mobile birds. They spend most of their life aerial, flying around, catching insects for us. So we want them around because they're eating insects. They're natural insect controllers for us. I think most of you can probably guess what species is nesting in this nest, considering the size clue there of just the size of a quarter being equal to the outside uh, edge of this nest. And yes, it's a hummingbird. For those of us east of the Mississippi, we have one species of hummingbird nesting, just the 
uh, ruby-throated hummingbird, Texas. There's one other, two other species nesting. And then we do have some friends from Colorado and West that they have even more species that can nest. And all of them will use the same sort of structure. It's small, it's usually stuck on top of a branch, and they camouflage it using quite often lichens or other loose materials to build that outside so their nest blends in and looks just like a lump on the branch rather than something extra that's there. Here's one with two young inside it. And again, you can see all the scaling of those lichens being attached. That's a lot of work, it seems. It is, hummingbirds are not the only birds though that will decorate the outside of their nest as camouflage. I found quite a few of them and I, looked at it and went, that's way too big for a hummingbird. It wasn't really big, but it was definitely too big for a hummingbird. And then finally, once I got to see who it was, it was the blue gray gnat catcher. And there are other gnat catcher west species out west, but all of them have a nest like this. You can see that there's some sort of material sticking it together, and that's not saliva with making all these strands to attach the nest to the side of the branch. Instead, they're capturing spider webs and sometimes other loose threads from things like milkweed seeds that might have a string on them still. And what's amazing is that they can build that and then attach all of that camouflage to the outside of their nest. Before the leaves came out a few weeks ago, I think a few of us might have been able to find this lump up in the branches and went, oh no, somebody's nest broke apart, but it's barely hanging on. Actually, this nest was always barely hanging on. It was built by the Baltimore Oriole, that they will have this purse-shaped nest. It's usually right on, on the edge of the branches. Um, in their interesting structure, I wish we could get more photos of them, but they're usually so far up high in the trees, it's really tough to get good, good photos of them, that it's kind of deceiving where the hole is and it actually foils the attempts of most predators to be able to get to their young. And then we have a few other birds that have quite unique nesting locations and structures. Uh, for many of us living in Southern Connecticut, there's some colonies in Rhode Island and Massachusetts as well, Chicago area of these monk parakeets. They're native to Southern South America, so from a temperate climate. So they are adapted for living in our temperate areas of Northern North America. And they might build a very large nest that they can be colonial and colonial to the point that it completely covers the entire top of a tree. And if you travel to other parts of the U.S. where it's warmer, Florida, South Texas, you might see in Southern California, there are quite a few different species of birds that have been part of the pet trade have escaped. They've escaped at such numbers that they can now reproduce successfully outdoors. Um, one thing with a nest like this that was a challenge 20 years ago or so in particular in the Northeast was that some of these monk parakeets learned that if they were trying to build a nest, there were these human-made trees. And some of them, there was a heater on the tree for them. And they would build their nests there. And that, what I'm describing, is that the birds, their perception of the whole situation was that they were building their nests up against the transformers on the edge of the tree because, well, they are warm inside. So it was one way they could survive the winters a little bit better. Um, utility companies and some researchers have worked over the last 10 years in particular and come up with special structures and insulating of the wires of that area so that way we don't have as many uh, electrocutions of either the monk parakeets or the sticks catching on fire and causing even more of a hazard for the firefighters and everyone losing power. So everybody's been living in harmony over the past few years even better. So it's a unique little treat in some uh, areas of Southern Connecticut, Long Island, and uh, Northern New Jersey in particular, where we, we have uh, about 1,100 monk parakeets in Southern Connecticut alone. So some eggs. We talked about those killed the year before, having eggs that look like rocks. 
amazing camouflage. So if they live on the ground, their eggs have to be camouflaged. Or if their nest is out in the open, they have speckles and things that make it so that the birds are, the eggs are protected when the parents aren't on the nest. Because if they haven't laid all their eggs yet, they will not start incubating yet for all these songbirds. Hawks and owls and some other species will start to incubate as soon as they lay one egg and it might be a day or two before the next egg, so the young end up being a few days apart and hatching. But most of our songbirds, they are incubating all their eggs at the same exact time. If their nest is under cover, like this nest, they moved the branches apart, the photographer did, and bright blue eggs in a nest that we can see wrapped with what looks like roots and also vines from nearby is most likely American robin eggs. But one egg doesn't look the same in there, does it? That is a challenge for our songbirds in the Northeast in particular, is that that egg and that young is not going to be a robin. Instead, it is a cowbird, a brown-headed cowbird, that these birds are nest parasites is what we call them. But that's a behavior of theirs. They're native to North America, but originally they spent their times and they were adapted for living in the Great Plains with the bison herds. And the birds lived with the herds and the herds would always move. So to take an entire month or six weeks off to build a nest, lay the eggs, incubate the eggs and raise the young, they would lose the herd that they were always following and the buffalo would be help kicking up and helping them find their food easier. So what they adapted to do was that they would lay their eggs in somebody else's nest while they were on the move. And quite often it was things like uh, shrikes, the loggerhead shrikes. And many of the other birds from the Great Plains are adapted for cowbird eggs and they can still raise their own young. They raise some cowbirds, but it doesn't become such an issue that they, um, the success of their own young is at danger. But when we get north into east out of the Great Plains and we now have open areas like highways and power line right of -ways. The cowbirds can move along and they will find bird nests on the edge of these open areas. And when they do, they lay their eggs in there and those parents have an instinct to feed the biggest mouth first. If I can have one young survive and to fledge, that is the minimum success those adult birds are looking for. And in this case, that big mouth, the biggest one, ends up being bigger than they are. And they have spent all their energy collecting caterpillars and other insects to feed a full nest. And they can only seem to successfully raise one of them. And in this case, they raised cowbird and not their own, which this is an adult Wilson's warbler. And this was a problem for many years with the endangered Kirtland's warbler in Michigan. Um, but we've been able to figure out some solutions for that. And in the Northeast, we do have concerns of some of our favorite forest birds like wood thrushes and oven birds. And even our birds on the edge like goldfinches, we do have a concern of parasitism for brown-headed cowbirds. So a few more views of the baby birds. I think that's what some of you are waiting around for this afternoon. Eastern bluebirds. Once the young are starting to fledge, it's still a few more days that the adults will help raise them out of the, feed them when they're out of the nest box. And young thrushes all have an amazing set of spots on their chest. It probably helps as a bit of camouflage. If you're near a bit of water, you might get to see some of our water birds like this. Looks like a common tern feeding its young. And you might be walking along the woods and suddenly hear a weird screeching or hissing noise up in the trees a bit. And it's time to move outdoors a little bit more often, take time to stop and listen. And when you hear a noise, you're not sure what it is, seek out that noise a little bit. And you might be surprised to look around the other side of the tree and there's a woodpecker cavity with young with their heads sticking out in the next few weeks as well. Here's a different view. And an amazing shot I just wanted to share because it's got that adult with that tongue sticking out. For our friends down the southeast, they can get to see cavity nesting birds like these prothonotary warblers going in and out of one of the knees, they call them, of the cypress trees. 
believe this was actually taken on the boardwalk at the Bidler Forest Audubon Center in the uh, in South Carolina. So we will talk about a few other ways that people can help baby birds and birds nesting. We think of providing nesting materials. But I wanted to share with you some math that we share with all of our middle schoolers when they visit for field trips. That they're studying ecology and food webs, but to understand the sheer mass and numbers of what's actually occurring in the ecosystem around us. That a pair of chickadees have to bring on average 500 caterpillars to their nest a day, a day. And they might have young in their nest for 14 to 16 days that could add up to over 9,000 caterpillars that their one pair of birds has to capture in 16 days. And they need to return so often with them that they really are never moving more than 100 yards away from that nest. So it's relatively about an acre in size around them is their territory per pair of these small songbirds. And it's not just chickadees. Robins that you think of as always eating worms. Yes, we can see them carrying worms back to the nest sometimes, but really the ideal food source is caterpillars. Because, well, we all are told what's one of the most healthy things for us to eat is our leafy greens. They aren't adapted with their mouths or their stomachs for eating the leafy greens, but that caterpillar just ate leafy greens, didn't it? So you are what you eat, so to speak, and the caterpillar is full of all those nutrients that we think of when we're told to eat our kale, those phyto, um, the carotenoids and all the other proteins that are in these leaves are inside that caterpillar, and it just happens to come in a nice, squishy, soft capsule for the birds to eat. They've done studies, and robins and the other thrushes, even for them, it's about 50% of the uh, suggested diet for the baby birds that on average a pair will bring back about 50% of the time back they're returning with caterpillars for their young to eat. Pretty remarkable that there are that many caterpillars out there but we need more native plants for there to be the caterpillars. We'll get to that in a moment. Before the leaves popped out one of our easiest nests to spot for any of us is great horned owls, that they're one of our earliest nesting species all across the US. That's often because they didn't build their own nest. No owl ever really builds a nest. They borrow somebody else's space, whether it's an old hawk nest or heron nest, even old squirrel nests will be used by great horned owls. They'll use the part of a cliff or some of our other species are cavity nesters, so they'll use an old hole in a tree, maybe by a pileated woodpecker, maybe one that was a natural cavity. Um, but because they're nesting so early, we can get to see them in the nest before all the leaves pop out quite often. Or if you go to your favorite area of water, you might get to see waterfowl with their young. They're an early nester as well over most of our areas. And here we have a common merganser with two young on her back. Not all waterfowl carry their young on their back. They're usually following behind them, especially as they get larger. And some of you might have saw this article on Audubon.org last week. It's a repeat since 2017. They've been resharing this photo. If you want to count all of them, I could share the photo with you. It ends up being just over 50 young in this one photo here. I think they might have had to crop out some of it actually to fit. Uh, Female common mergansers often will have a behavior called egg dumping, that it's that they will lay eggs in another merganser's nest cavity. By doing this, just in case a raccoon or somebody else raids their nest, some of their genes are being passed on, some of their young are being raised by another merganser. But also sometimes that means that some of them don't have their own nest cavity, but they're laying eggs in other locations. Sometimes there could be 20 or more eggs in one nest cavity that are being incubated and raised by one female. After they're out on the water, the young are all imprinted and it looks like mom, but they aren't really good at telling one from another of individuals. And the mothers don't know which babies are theirs. They just know that they have babies behind them. And so groups will often merge and there's safety in numbers. 
So in this case, the photographer went back and after seeing 50 in one group, it actually got up to a high of 76 chicks with one mother uh, merganser. And that's a pretty remarkable number. I've seen 20 something. And I thought that was amazing in Connecticut, but that was in Bemidji, Minnesota in 2017. So quickly, a few things that we can all do. There are different nest boxes. Checking with your state's uh, wildlife division of the Natural Resources or Environmental Protection Agency that you can find nest box plans for the birds that are most native to you. Most of our nature stores around us might also have proper nest boxes as well. Um, so take a look there. Also, we know that one question we get the most at Audubon this time of year is, I found a baby bird, what do I do with it? First and foremost, if you can put it back outside in something soft, up away from where a cat might get it immediately, and give it some time, the parents might just have been scared by you, or they might have been delayed in finding food, whatever it might be. If the parents can still take care of the bird, there's a much, much higher success rate, even if it's not back in its original nest that success for our colleagues that work in wildlife rehab is a tough work and it's not as successful as we might all dream it might be. They do an amazing work, they do their best, but we can't recreate exactly what's going on out in the wild. But the parents are bringing back maybe a more variation in food than what we're able to provide for them. But we do our best and the Audubon Center at Sharon in Northwestern Connecticut is actually the largest baby bird nursery in Connecticut. And this is a photo there. And one of the things you might be able to do is help support them. They have a wish list on Amazon for buying more mealworms or crickets and the other foods that the birds might need. Um, also, if you're crafty and well, supplies are running short on making new masks for everyone. If you're into knitting instead, we there are patterns online, search for knitted nests, KN for knitting and KN for nest and you'll find the patterns for that and it's a group that they'll also be able to tell you which groups out there would be in most need of new knitted nests for their wildlife rehab centers. And maybe if you happen to have one in your area, it would be great that they do need some volunteers at times as well, that if that's something that's for in your, in something you're inclined to do, but usually that requires extra training and also a apprenticeship. I know in Connecticut, at least, that's the process that we have people we know who want to be more involved. But there's a lot of training to make sure that we don't imprint those birds while we're doing the work of trying to save them. Some of us can't get out right now for a variety of reasons or on bad weather days. You can get to appreciate birds at home that Cornell Lab of Ornithology and explore.org are two wonderful spots to get to find nest cams. And if you just, even on Google, put in your favorite bird name and nest cam, you'll probably be able to find a camera of it. Birds that nest in cavities or in boxes, it happens the most often um, that there are cameras built into them. They've even put them inside purple martin gourds. Um, the first person I knew who did this was actually Phil Donahue, the talk show host, lived in Westport, Connecticut and had a wonderful purple martin colony. And uh, so he loved him so much, he asked for the technology to be stuck inside the gourd in his yard. So um, he since moved and the birds are still surviving with the new landowners. But um, it was just surprising that somebody that you might not expect was actually most interested in a nest cam to start. And sometimes we get to see a weird view of them. The birds get a little bit too close to the cameras, but some of the new technology, they've got night vision on them. There's people, we have uh, some for Audubon, Connecticut, where one of our board members can from home with his laptop control and move the camera. So we can turn the angle, he can zoom in and out. So they'll change it on a regular basis. Um, and they're just so amusing. I have friends who send me different links to them all the time. and. Maybe it's that you're used to your birds or maybe you live too far south and the bald eagles are already off nests. Well, the birds in Maine are just starting to nest and you can watch the cycle all over again. For those of us living near the shore, and this can be you only visit the beach once a year, Audubon has a new campaign we just started two weeks ago of share the love, share the shore. And if you go to Audubon's website for and look for our Coasts program, 
there we have an online campaign for you to pledge to be a good egg that if you could pledge before you go to the beach to think about what you will, your behaviors beforehand, making sure you know whether dogs are allowed on that beach or not to start, that it's on a leash, that you will stay away from all of the flagged off areas and signed off areas of the beach so that we give the birds more space than the, the fencing is there as a minimum, that if we can stay further away, we'll give the birds more space this season. So thank you. If you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat box to start and Jillian and or Kate will start to read some of those questions back for us. I'm gonna start by sharing a little story in here while others of you start to find the chat box. For some of you might not know, there's the mute and stop video. It's on the top or the bottom of your screen right now. And there's a more with three dots. If you click on that, you'll be able to get to the chat box as well to be able to ask any questions you might have. But Sharon was sharing that she had a uh, podcast, This Is Love, was uh, an interview with a birder, Drew Lanham. He's actually a board member of National Audubon Society. And they reminisced about uh, this interviewer, Phoebe, and her grandmother used to clean out their hairbrush and put the hair outside for the birds. We can use a lot of different materials. I could have added that in as well that um, the one thing I would say don't put outside is your dryer lint, especially if you use any sort of fabric softeners, that is not healthy for the birds. But hair, from your hairbrush, from brushing your cat or your dog, those are great and birds love that stuff. Um, so thank you for sharing that, yes. Okay, I have some questions for you. Yeah. They're coming in fast and furious, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. So, Linda asks, are bird mites in a nest a hazard for people? Most likely not. They are, um, most of them are species specific, not like ticks that can transfer from one to another. I know that there are some species of birds that carry deer ticks, usually in the nymph form before that they, and they might pass to us. But um, if you have a nest box and you're trying to um, clean it out or whatever, I don't believe that will harm you. Saying that, people love bringing me bird nests and I don't want them. I, bird nests, <laughs> is, in, in, in theory, is one of the more filthy on a large scale ideas. It's not exactly, but um, yes, there are all of those things. So if you are concerned about that, um, leaving it out so that way, once all the birds are gone, the mites will leave as well. Um, so if you are concerned about that, let it be for a bit. But technically you need to have a license to be able to keep a bird nest. So just keep that in mind. Hope that answers it. Next. Uh, Victoria asks, mm -hmm. what is the status of bobolink nests in grasslands in New England? Mm -hmm. uh, great question. So bobolink are a relative of blackbirds and they need nests in grasslands that they need a uh, old hayfield type looking habitat of at least 10 acres and they do better when it's even larger than that space and their nesting cycle usually doesn't line up with the farmers trying to cut hay because they want to cut the hay in june so that they actually get really good hay in end of july and then we end up with two cycles of baby bobolinks being cut up possibly by the mowers so audubon um Massachusetts Audubon, Audubon Vermont, and a few other conservation partners are working to help bobolink as much as we can. In Vermont in particular, we have an interesting uh, reverse uh, program where they are, it's a reverse auction and the farmers are auctioning off to the conservation organization that if you paid me $20 an acre, I will save off a hundred acres for bobolink this season that they're just thinking of it in that scale. Um, so we are, conservation groups are raising money to pay the farmers to wait, that they can still get one set of hay out of it, but they have to wait for the bobbling to be done. And that's what we're working with them on. So I would say it's not great, but it's been doing better, especially the last five years. Um, now it's uh, making sure that the spaces they have aren't converted to other spaces, um, but we are working with farmers a lot more. Great question. Okay, um, Kim Ray, asks, what would the merganser chicks eat? 
Uh, when they're really small, they are eating uh, the invertebrates in the water. So um, if you see fly fishermen, it's the little insects that are in the bottom of the river or in the bottom of the lake and swimming up that that's to emerge out. That's what they're probably eating first. Then they are slowly starting to learn to eat some of the small minnows that are in those waterways as well before they can eat full on fish. Um, especially when there's 76 behind them and how active they are. Adult mergansers don't usually hunt and collect food for their young. Their young have to nibble at what's there. But it's, it's mostly insect-like stuff, um, not plant materials. Um, this is, uh, I don't know who this one is from. Um, mm -hmm. What were some solutions to protecting nests from cowbirds? Oh, uh, that's a tough, tough question. Um, it, it got to be a really tough moral decision, but for part of the program in Michigan, um, the U.S. Department of Agriculture actually had to um, come and they had to do a specific hunt just for brown-headed cowbirds. So it was um, a last resort. What we start to do in the Northeast is that we're trying to work on making sure we keep the best sections of our forest for our forest breeding birds as a contiguous habitat. The, if we can, we try and limit the, the roadways. And then also if we can make sure that there's a canopy over the roads that we do have into the forest, um, the cowbirds need wide openings. They don't go in, follow a road if there's a canopy over it. So um, any new right of for utilities and stuff, we're trying to make sure that they're as, as narrow as possible. So that way we're limiting, um, we're outsmarting the cowbirds the best that we can. Um, Kathy would like to know, how does the parent bird pick which baby to feed? They usually, if they can, the instinct is to choose the largest mouth first. So that's why they all, when you suddenly see them, they don't look like much and then something, it's like a huge mouth came out of nowhere, um, like a horror movie for these little tiny baby birds. It's because they're trying to attract the parent's attention first. And that's where the instinct lies. And that's why when there's a um, brood parasite, they can, if they're larger than the other species, they, they have that advantage. Um, Norma asks, do birds, specifically house finches, return to the same nest year to year? Um, they will be in the same area, like your yard but none of these songbirds use the same exact nest structure. Even when it comes to bluebirds using bluebird boxes, they tend to build over their nest. They will double, they will stack up on it or at least put new materials in it um, that they rarely reuse that site. Even when hawks and owls come back, it's the same physical nest, but they do some sort of remodeling every year. Uh, but our songbirds, it's the same relative area and we know from bird banding and capturing them during the nesting season, that they do have great fidelity to coming back to the same site. Kathleen asks, where do chestnut-sided warblers nest? Mm -hmm. Chestnut-sided warblers prefer uh, young forests. So areas where the trees are 20, 30 feet tall and like as thick as your leg, that's the area where um, Chestnut-sided warblers like to be usually where it's really young forest, maybe only 10 to 20 foot tall trees as well, um, not deep in the forest. So um, most places I say power line right away is a great spot to try and find them on the edges of that. Okay, got some more questions. Sure. From Norma, is it common for house wrens to leave sticks in nest boxes that they're not, I think maybe she meant that they're no longer in? <laughs> ah, well, um, they actually build dummy nests, so to speak. Uh, many of our wren species, not just house wrens, but even marsh wrens do this in the reeds. The males will build multiple nests, sometimes up to six different nests. And then the female essentially chooses the, the, the best choice and she will finish off and do the last pieces of the nest, the inner part of it herself, um, as an indication of this is the one that we're going to use this season. 
we think the behavior might help with um, confusing predators, that if there's multiple nests and they keep on going, oh, that looks like a nest that's in there, and then there's nothing, they might just give up because they go, oh, I missed the cycle, they're already done nesting. And we think that that's why they're doing it. Another question from Norma. Where do scarlet tanagers nest? Usually uh, into interior, larger forests, most often oak, but I've also found them up in the Adirondacks in Vermont where it's more of a maple beech forest as well. But usually it's, um, we tell forest landowners when we're doing habitat assessments for large, for forest owners, it's usually 50 plus acres, if not more than 100 plus acres, is a section of forest before um, scarlet tanagers will call it home. And sometimes it might be near an, a one edge of that, like near your house when they got 50 more acres further back. Um, we don't know why they do that, but it's usually that there is contiguous forest, a lot of it in larger, older trees, and they spend their life up there on the top. And from Mary Ellen, do you know of a page on Facebook or anywhere similar to what's this bird that you can post a photo of a nest and experts can help you to identify who made it? Uh, there are definitely, I think there is a Facebook page exactly labeled that what's this bird or identify this bird help. And then there's also locally, like in Connecticut, I know there's a, um, Connecticut birds list and a Connecticut Audubon nature photos page. And on any of those, you can post a photo and ask for identification help. An expert may or may not be the first person to comment and identify for you. Um, Cause I do find it amusing that myself and a few others that have been past presidents of the Ornithological Association, we will comment on the identification and then somebody else will come in and say, maybe it's something else. That's definitely not the answer because we already <laughs> answered it correctly. So um, do, you can try that. Um, and I believe there is a, a, a way on Audubon's website to suggest that. You could also try in the apps in your phone, the Merlin app and also um, the Audubon oh, app. There's one way, but Merlin is a app. You can actually insert your photo into the Merlin app if you have a photo of it and it will help you with it. Oh, a photo of a nest? Merlin might not work on nests yet. Right, okay. Yep. And Jim asks, are there particular invasive plant species in the Northeast that are most problematic for caterpillars and the birds that feed on them? Um, so the issue for caterpillars on invasive plants is that caterpillars just won't even eat them. They just won't be found on the invasive plants. Things like Japanese barberry and um, ginkgo, well ginkgo trees only support four species of native insects. And Japanese barberry is under 20 species of caterpillars while a blueberry bush right next to it can support over two to 300 species of caterpillars. Um, so what we just need to do is remove any invasives and replace them with any native plant will automatically increase that um, type of caterpillar for you. I don't believe of any that actually make it so the cat to reduce it. Um, I guess what I might, he might, Jim might be getting to is that there is one or two um, post plants. A black swallowwort looks a lot like a, um, a milkweed and that could be a problem for monarch butterflies would be the one that I would say that there's actually a direct link but most of them it's just nobody wants to eat it so they aren't there to begin with. And all right one or two more because we're I don't want to keep people all afternoon but yes. Sure thing. Uh, this question is from Dana. When should we clean out our bird boxes? I'm going to pass that to Kate. <laughs> Um, obviously, you should clean out your bird boxes uh, before the start of the nesting season. Um, but right now uh, is kind of prime nesting area. I have had some bluebirds that have fledged already. Um, so you can clean out the nest after the birds have fledged. Um, like Ken was saying, the bluebird may um, use the same nest, but it may still do a little remodeling over it. So um, it's not a big deal if you take it out 
Um, you should absolutely check your boxes um, weekly. Um, and so you know exactly what's going on in them. Um, so yeah, so you should, you should be cleaning them out often, in fact. Um, And I have one more question. I believe this person has just logged off, but I wanted to ask it anyway because I think it could be helpful for, or just share their comment uh, for the group. Um, it was from iPhone X. I have lots of birds in and around my yard, but the only nest location I know for sure that is in use is the house sparrows, and they use um, the bluebird box every year. Um. So I think maybe increasing the native plants around, some birds just kind of know whether there's food around or not. And um, to learn more about that, there's Nature's Best Hope is a book by Doug Tallamy that Claudia just put into the chat box a moment ago as well. And um, to limit the house sparrows, you can put a, um, a plate over the front of the bluebird box. Maybe you're never gonna get bluebirds because it doesn't look enough like their habitat for them but you could put a plate over it so it's a smaller hole and then only the chickadees and house friends can fit inside. And you've at least deterred the house sparrows, which are usually a little bit more um, uh, dominant over the other species as well. And last question, what is a good bird cider app that IDs birds by song or call? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm teaching a birdie by ear class and uh, people ask for this all the time and I say that you can try them, but I know that my role of teaching people how to re recognize the bird sounds will still be there for a while. It's new technology, it's just starting. Song Sleuth is the name of an app that is free. There's also Bird Genie. Um, those are the two most common ones at the moment that will um, match up. It works very well for some very common species, but any if there's too much background noise or other things, computers just aren't, haven't been taught enough. So while, so once the computer learning gets better, the software will get better. Um, since most people are still listening, I just wanna make one more comment about Mary Ellen and the Facebook groups. As I was saying before about taking photos of bird nests and the photographers having big lenses, many of these Facebook groups right now actually have a rule of not posting nest photos. They're trying to discourage people from going out and that some people love to get photos and get likes on their photos. So to discourage that, just don't post the photos on some of these groups. We had an issue already in Southern Connecticut that an American oyster catcher chick would, died because of harassment, that the adult spent too much time in alarm mode and trying to distract the human who didn't care. It just wanted photos of the baby chick and the baby chick uh, didn't get enough food, and we think it got weak and died because of the photographers overloving the birds. So, thank you. <clears throat> so, great afternoon, everyone. I appreciate that. We can see you in a few more weeks. We'll talk more about shorebirds and sharing your shores, and we'll also have a wildflower folklore program in a few weeks as well. <laughs>